there is no bad referral. A bad referral is a referral which, <laughs> which is not done. Welcome to this episode of Hearing Health Today. I'm your host, Craig Sharp. In today's episode, part one of a two-part segment, we're going to do a deep dive into progressive hearing loss and explore what happens or doesn't happen when hearing aids are no longer enough. In part one of this series, we'll be speaking with Professor Ora Kappa, Professor of Audiology at University Hospital and Head of the Cochlear Implant Center, Cicero, in Erlangen, Germany. This is a podcast for hearing health professionals. If you're a person with hearing loss or a member of the general public, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. Professor Hoppe, thanks for joining us on today's episode of Hearing Health Today. Out of curiosity, where are we reaching you? Yeah, good morning. Uh, I'm now on the other side on the earth uh, in Germany, and I'm in my office. Uh, it's morning, uh, coffee time, for, uh, regularly, <laughs> yeah. and, and it's a great day here. Fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us. Hopefully you have a, a strong cup of coffee with you there in Germany. On today's episode, we're discussing the migration from hearing aids to cochlear implants. And I wanted to kick off by asking you, why do you think it's so challenging for patients with hearing loss to get the appropriate level of treatment? Uh, let me go a little bit before the time uh, where the switch is necessary. In the first, hearing impairment is an invisible impairment as long as you do nothing against it. I know so many people hard of hearing, but they don't wear hearing aids, they do nothing. So they are not very happy, but when these people try hearing aids, usually they improve their hearing a lot and they yeah can cope with them. But then over the times, many people have a, a progressive hearing loss and hearing become worse and worse. But uh, this is a progress which is which lasts very long and they do not realize that uh, their everyday life communication is just based on lip reading and uh, and other things why do you think that um so many people struggle to receive treatment for hearing loss just from the beginning you mentioned that a lot of people um have sort of this invisible hearing loss but there's a lot of inertia even to just get a hearing aid what, what why do you think that is I think it is because you have something behind or in your ears. And uh, I, I know many people who say, uh, oh, uh, I have a slight impairment, but no one should uh, see this. And uh, this is from the psychological view, uh, yeah, the first barrier for, for hearing impaired people. And we have a similar situation for the next step because uh, you, you wear hearing aids for longer time, for years and years, and uh, then maybe they are not enough. But uh, then we have the similar situation because the step to a, a cochlear implant is uh, an another thing. And uh, because they are not aware that the hearing aids provide not enough amplification. You said something interesting where when you have hearing loss and you make the decision to get a hearing aid, it's visible to everyone that you have a hearing impairment. Do you think that that's changing slightly with the introduction of hearables and even um, some of the hearing amplification features that the AirPods, for example, um, recently came out with? Yeah, uh, this is changing. This changed uh, tremendously over the last years. But uh, still, two years ago, I had a famous politician here in my office, and he is hard of hearing, and he tried small, just with a mirror, he tried and looked and said, no, I cannot wear hearing aids because then in my party, everyone is laughing about me in the background. Sounds like maybe some progress that's made, but still ways to go on that front. Yeah. I'm curious, have you seen people that have actually been more likely to receive treatment for their hearing because they've used maybe a more consumer hearing amplification device? Uh, yes, I, I think uh, because today nearly everyone walks around the street with something in the ears, AirPods or something, and uh, Bluetooth devices, headsets. And uh, so hearing aids are not these uh, tiny little uh, uh, yeah, uh, skin colored uh, things <laughs> for uh, only worn by older people. Yeah, I remember a few years ago and, you know, no one would be caught dead walking around with a Bluetooth headset. 
but uh, now everyone is walking around with AirPods or whatever in their ear. Um, well, I guess going back to what you said about, so once people do receive treatment um, for a hearing aid so that they have um, some level of intervention for their hearing loss, what causes people to get stuck in that channel when, when hearing aids become no longer enough? Yeah, uh, one important issue is that these people change their lifestyle habits. Uh, they avoid acoustically challenging situation as going to cinema, theater, pubs, or crowded restaurants. And uh, they reduce their communication to easy situation. For example, with uh, well-known people in a face-to-face -face conversation. And they avoid all other uh, situations. Uh, this uh, is what you see when the hearing impairment progresses over years. And then, in another example, I uh, know some couples where one is uh, hard of hearing and the other one has normal hearing, and uh, there is a dependency. The normal hearing partner does a communication for the whole family and for, for this couple, and uh, this is a, not a good situation, but uh, I see it very often. Because people have changed their lifestyle, as their hearing loss progresses, is it less evident maybe or less top of mind that they still do have a significant hearing loss and, and might need to escalate treatment? Sometimes they don't know about uh, possible treatments and uh, sometimes they have fears and th they are more or less uh, happy with their situation or not happy, but confident. Or, or I guess resigned to it, maybe, yeah. So it sounds like there's quite a bit of like psychological barriers to even seeking the next level of treatment. If someone were to get over that hurdle, are there other barriers that might prevent people from getting um, sort of the next level of therapy, whether that's a cochlear implant or, or some other intervention? When I came the first time to Australia, uh, I was in, in taxi going from the airport in Brisbane and uh, the taxi driver asked me, oh, where are you going to? I told them I'm going to a, an audiological conference. Not very uh, interesting, I thought. The taxi driver immediately told me, oh, that's a, a very good thing, these hearing aids and these cochlear implants. And, and I was very astonished because in Germany, I know many medical doctors who don't know about a cochlear implant and uh, my impression was that in uh, this country in australia every taxi driver knows about cochlear implants. <laughs> it sounds like there's an awareness problem that there are even treatment options beyond hearing aids both on the side of consumers patients and also healthcare professionals is that accurate yeah Healthcare professionals, they know something about cochlear implants, but probably they know the status 20 years before. They left university 10 or 20 years before, and uh, they don't know anything about the power of cochlear implants in, in these days now. Is that true for audiologists as well, for like uh, hearing aid audiologists or acousticians? I, uh, I cannot speak about all countries, but in Germany, we have a strong separation for hearing aid dispensers. We have shops uh, who do the hearing aid fitting, uh, and we have cochlear implant centers. This separation is, yeah, it is a barrier for providing these hearing aid acousticians with the information about cochlear implants. Why isn't there one place where you can just go and get all of your treatment or information about hearing loss? Yeah, that's a, a problem of numbers, I think. Cochlear implantation is a very rare thing. We have in Germany about 50 implantations per year per 1 million habitants. So if you have a really large town, we have one cochlear implant center and probably you have 100 shops for hearing aids. So th there is a, a large difference. So you have to bring the information to them, but not every hearing aid acoustician has access to cochlear implants. It, it's funny, it sounds like a bit of a catch-22. Like There are a lot of people that could benefit from cochlear implants, but the access to care isn't always there because at the moment, cochlear implantation is uh, rare compared to hearing aids, but it's rare compared to hearing aids because there aren't as many people that have cochlear implants. So yeah. <laughs> how do you solve that riddle? We try to bring the information out to the people and uh, directly to the 
to the patients. And uh, we in our cochlear implant center have, for example, once a year a hearing day. It's not a cochlear implant day. It's not a hearing aid day. It's a hearing day. And this day, we uh, have about 250 hearing impaired people coming every year to our uh, center. Uh, we have talks about hearing aids, tinnitus, um, uh, and cochlear implants in particular. We have many people already implanted and they tell the others what was good and what is uh, sometimes a problem with cochlear implants because this is also important to tell the whole story. And has that been pretty successful in building awareness? This was the only solution. We started in 2008 with this uh, day to make the topic hearing uh, little bit sexy and to, <laughs> to, to, for people and not to have only people there uh, who are uh, frustrated but over the years we we had prominent persons talking about their life with hearing aids or with cochlear implants and today it is uh, yeah it's a standard congress in here in our region and we have 200 or 300 people coming every year one audiologist told me that Often people are candidates for cochlear implants um, years before they actually receive one. And I'm just curious, if someone were to get the intervention sooner, I guess, um, as soon as they became a candidate versus later, do you see a difference in terms of long-term performance or outcomes? It, it, the longer you wait for a cochlear implant, the longer you... Uh, are hard of hearing, the longer you lose information and you change your lifestyle habits. And these things are more important maybe than the uh, neural nerve functioning or whatever. Do you ever encourage patients to um, connect with someone else that did go through that journey and receive a cochlear implant? Yeah, in our region, some cities, groups of patients who meet every month, and uh, these meetings are very important. And we have all the information here in our center and encourage them to go to these meetings and to talk with people who are already wearing an implant. This is a much more convincing ask talking with someone who has a cochlear implant than to talk with a professional who says, oh, you need something and I do the implantation and everything will be fine. Yeah, yeah, sure. I guess like there's the potential that that could be taken as another sort of promise that might not actually fulfill itself. There is risk that people may lose their regular hearing. Sure. You have a high risk that the residual hearing goes down. But on the other side, you have chance that with the implant, the hearing is better than with any hearing aid before. So it is not on both sides worse, but just the chance that's on the implanted side. It's a very important information because some patients don't know this. I'm curious, you mentioned that there could be a chance of losing residual hearing with a cochlear implant. If these patients or candidates have severe to profound hearing loss, how often is that residual hearing actually functional? This depends. When you speak about speech perception, this residual hearing is typically not very important. When you speak about waking up in the morning without any light or something, this residual hearing might help you. But typically, when we implant a patient on one side, this side, the residual hearing is very low. And it is sometimes for the patient from the subjective view from the individual view for this patient important, but sometimes they don't recognize that this is a way after implantation. What would your advice be to a hearing health professional who predominantly treats patients with hearing aids who has never referred one of their patients for a cochlear implant? First, I would say that this one should inform about cochlear implants. Probably he or she should go to the cochlear implant center and see how they are working. Then they have to keep in mind that referring for cochlear implantation is just giving the patient, just providing the patient with a chance to enhance hearing. It is not losing a patient. It is the counsel to ask for another solution, which is probably better. 
And this professional should keep in mind that the cochlear implant centers have extensive batteries of hearing tests and audiometry, hearing aid, vestibular tests, and so on, and computer tomography, magnetic imaging, MRI imaging. And uh, these measurements give a picture for the experts how the chance is to increase the hearing. And it's at the end, the patient can decide what is going on with him. Yeah, that's an interesting point. So just referring doesn't mean that you're necessarily losing the patient. It might just be that you're providing them with more information. I've heard from a few acousticians and hearing aid audiologists that they're sometimes hesitant to refer because they're not entirely sure what the candidacy criteria is for a cochlear implant. So they don't want to send a bad referral. I guess, what would your advice be to folks in that situation? It is in our center common that people come to us and ask for cochlear implants and we say, no, your hearing aids are better than every cochlear implant. Your hearing is good enough. It's better to see a patient and to counsel a patient than to not provide him with a chance to receive better hearing. But we have in Germany, I think we have speech audiometry in many countries all around the world. We have a special test, a monosyllabic test with single short words. And this can be done in every shop and you can, without lip reading, when this speech perception is below 50%, you see that there is a chance that the cochlear implant provides better hearing. Okay, so there might even be some basic screening that uh, they could do at the acoustician's office or the hearing aid audiologist's office prior to referral if they were concerned about whether or not this might be a good move. What do you think that the hearing professional community and the manufacturers of either cochlear implants or hearing aids could do to create more awareness around all the different treatment options that are available for hearing loss, all the way from you know your entry-level uh, or basic hearing aid through to a cochlear implant? Information, information, information. <laughs> this <laughs> triple I. <laughs> we have to inform that hearing is so important. Listening and communication is such an important thing. When you are not hard of hearing, when you have normal hearing, you don't think about your ears. But when you lose hearing, the situation becomes worse and worse. We have today, I think, only a few percent of jobs which do not need communication, acoustic communication. But most of the job in our societies depends on a good hearing. We should keep this in mind, we have to increase the awareness and that hearing is a very important thing. I'm always a bit perplexed. Like, it seems like uh, vision, for example, and vision impairment is something that's well accepted, that it's correlated with age, but no one shies away from getting glasses. Do you think that we'll ever be able to achieve a similar level of acceptance for hearing aids or other implantable hearing solutions? Honestly, I, I think we will never have the same level, but uh, we will have maybe a similar level. Uh, one thing is that it is very easy to increase the uh, uh, vision with eyeglasses because lenses can invert the problems you have in the eyes. With hearing, it, the situation is more complex. You can never, with any hearing aid, restore the normal hearing situation. You can only bring better listening, better speech perception in everyday life, but not in all situations. And this is a physiological problem uh, because we have the inner and outer hair cells and just uh, having a problem with the ears, with hearing, is not that everything is softer, not loud enough, but it is a problem of disturbed hearing and no hearing aid will restore the acoustic signal to that level as it is for normal hearing. But uh, it, it will help for many situations. And so I think using more the, of these hearing aids and cochlear implants will increase quality of life for many hard of hearing people. We've talked a lot about the referral pathway from an acoustician or a hearing aid audiologist when someone's no longer being helped by hearing aids and, and could benefit from a cochlear implant. I'm curious though, Sort of what role do primary care physicians or general practice MDs um, or even geriatricians, I guess, play in terms of identifying hearing loss in their patients and then referring them for appropriate treatment? Is that another avenue where there might be 
a lack of awareness or um, something that we could do as the hearing community to um, increase the level of education and awareness around treatment options? It is definitely an important issue. This GP quite often refer people to our center. It's not the ENT, it's not the acoustician, it is uh, as an audiologist, it is uh, quite often a GP. And we also try to inform these medical doctors about cochlear implants. So you mentioned earlier that a lot of patients with hearing loss who have a hearing aid and have a hearing aid for multiple years kind of get disillusioned by some of the marketing messages they hear about hearing aids. Like, this is the next best thing. It's going to solve all their issues. And, and when it doesn't, they might get a little despondent about what the future could hold. What happens when those patients who are good candidates for cochlear implants actually do progress to get a cochlear implant What's been your experience in terms of their feedback? Are they happy that they made that transition? Do they see a significant change in their hearing? You mean after implantation? After implantation, yeah. Yes. We have a very hard quality control in our center. Very simple. We measure speech comprehension and perception with hearing aids before for everyone. Uh, we measure it with headphones and we try to judge wh whether the hearing aids are enough or they need new hearing aids. And afterwards, six months after implantation, we uh, do quite similar tests with the implants. In, in fact, uh, we have a 99% success rate, meaning that they hear better or equal uh, to the situation. Wow, before. okay. Definitely, we have some patients where we t just say we can try a cochlear implant, but uh, during the evaluation process, we uh, see that uh, there is a chance that the implant may work, but there are other problems. But this is what we know before. Uh, at the end, we have uh, just 1%. Uh, this means in our center about one patient per year or two patients per year who are not happy with their implant. But the others have a pretty increased speech perception. So would you consider a referral to be a bad referral if it resulted in someone just finding out that they are doing just fine with the hearing aids that they have now and they might not yet be a candidate for cochlear implants? There is no bad referral. A bad referral is a referral uh, which <laughs> which is not done. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Because when the hearing is too good for cochlear implant, uh, it's perfect. I like this. I counsel people to say, this is the best solution you have and uh, go back to your acquisition and you, you will live years with, with this. Probably we have to stress more that in the cochlear implant center, there is an extensive battery of hearing tests and these hearing tests in the cochlear implant center are necessary to evaluate the degree of hearing loss, to de determine speech recognition with hearing aid and to judge whether hearing may be enhanced by other hearing aids or by cochlear implants. We do this every day. It lasts uh, about four hours, the whole procedure. But at the end, we have a picture of the patient and we have all the data necessary to counsel them going for cochlear implantation and counsel them about the risks and the chances you have with a cochlear implant. We have uh, an advice for hearing aid acquisition that they have to keep in mind referral is just providing new options and uh, patients will thank you, you or the hearing aid acquisition. Yeah, and I guess maybe on the flip side too, even if those uh, patients aren't candidates for a cochlear implant now, it at least provides some level of awareness that should their hearing deteriorate further, um, they know that there's some other option out there. Yeah, because uh, the truth is that most of the hearing loss types are progressive and over the years, very often people have to uh, go to a cochlear implant. In all your years of experience as an audiologist, what's sort of the most important thing that you've learned about being a hearing care professional? Probably the most important thing I learned over the year is that uh, hearing loss uh, is for us a degree, a number in terms of mild, moderate, and so on. But for people who are affected to have hearing loss, hearing is 
the key to other people and to communication. And we have to keep in mind that we don't have to treat ears, but we have to treat patients and help them. And this is what I learned more and more, that we cannot just decide what is done by data, but we have to talk with the people and to provide them a way for better hearing. Well, Professor Hoppe, thank you so much for joining us on this episode of Hearing Health Today. It was a true pleasure to speak with you today. Thank you. It was a pleasure for me. And thank you for listening to today's episode. Stay tuned for part two of this series, where we will speak with a patient who has progressive hearing loss and struggled with hearing aids for decades before receiving a referral for a cochlear implant. If you've enjoyed our podcast, please feel free to leave a rating and a review. We'd really appreciate it. If there's a particular topic you'd like us to cover, please mention it in your review. We'd love to get your feedback. Links to everything we discussed in today's episode is listed in the episode description. And until next time, please stay safe. Just a quick reminder that the views expressed by the interviewees in this podcast are their own and do not necessarily represent the views of Cochlear Limited or its subsidiaries. This material is intended for health professionals. If you are a consumer, please seek advice from your health professional about treatments for hearing loss. Outcomes may vary, and your health professional will advise about the factors which could affect your outcome.